to Dr. Surav Ghosh, who is an assistant professor of neurology, um, a recent addition to Yale faculty, has been here since uh, May, came from Arizona, and previously the Salk Institute in San Diego. Obviously, he didn't come here for the weather, but he really uh, has uh, revolutionary uh, work. And I asked him if I could, for the sake of time, to abbreviate his title and we're just going to stay with oncogenic signaling in glioblastomas. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thanks for being here. Am I, I have to turn it on. Um, yes, we are, uh, we are new over here, um, and I'm very excited to be here and at this opportunity to talk about our research. Um, as a lab, we are broadly interested in cancer cell signaling. Um, so, you know, I look forward to interacting with many of you um, eventually. And what I'm going to be talking about today is actually a project. Um, it's one of the major interests uh, in the lab. It, it's, um, it's actually um, a, a project that we recently uh, have been working on and it's, it's a continuing interest in the lab and we are focused on the disease glioblastoma. Now, for this audience, can, you, can everybody hear me? All right. So, um, for this audience, you know, it doesn't require much of an introduction, but just to get everybody on board, um, this is, a pa this is um, an example taken from a review by Eric Holland where he illustrates the key features of the disease. So glioblastoma uh, initially presents, um, you know, this is an MRI can, a scan of a, pres uh, of a patient. Uh, this is, there is some edema around. The patient undergoes um, essentially complete surgical resection. Uh, um, anywhere between 98 to 99% of the tumor cells are removed typically. And now with, uh, with fluorescent dyes such as uh, 5-ALA, uh, sometimes the resection is even described as, as total or 100%. Unfortunately, glioblastoma is a highly infiltrative disease, and even at the point of diagnosis, uh, there is infiltration of the tumor cells through the brain parenchyma. So in this particular case, the patient returns six months later, and the scan shows a uh, tumor not only at the original site, but also at a satellite site. So the tumor cells have been able to, to uh, move through the brain. and. If the second surgery uh, is also successful, removes tumor cells, but now, unfortunately, three, three months later, uh, we have a presentation, a binary presentation. The tumor cells have crossed the corpus callosum. This butterfly um, sort of uh, presentation is, is also classical because the ability of the tumor cells to infiltrate and move and invade through the brain quite rapidly, and this leads to, uh, to, to recurrence uh, of, the, of this tumor. There were um, two major steps in, in glioma uh, therapy. The first uh, major uh, hallmark was 1978, when radiation basically moved the survival uh, curves from here uh, to, to here. So there was a significant improvement in survival. And then in 2005, Roger Stube uh, introduced a, a, a chemotherapeutic agent that cross crosses the blood-brain barrier. So post Timozolomid, now the survival, at, at least in this study, it ex was extended from 12.1 to 14.6 months. But as you can see, the, despite the current standard of care, uh, the outcome is actually quite uh, abysmal in this disease. Uh, in, an, in, a, in a population of about 2,000 uh, patients, uh, the, in, in, this, in this paper, they described the median survival as, about as only 9.7 months, so this was unselected. Uh, you know, if untreated, this disease uh, is fatal in four to five months. Uh, when patients received some sort of uh, therapy of surgery as well as radiation in this post temozolomide era, it's only about 14.2 months. And um, you know the five-year survival or 10-year survival, uh, it's you know, it's 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 really bad. Unlike other tumors. Now we are in in the era of molecular medicine, so the cancer genome from glioblastoma has been sequenced. And what was realized is that there is about 50% uh, 50, 50 of clinical presentations are associated with gain-of-function mutations in EGFR. And by that, I mean either uh, amplification of the wild-type EGFR 
or mutations that lead to gain of function, uh, mainly uh, a mutant called EGFRV3, which is ligand independent and constitutively active. So as we heard last week from Dr. Lynch and from Dr. Politi, how uh, EGFR therapy has been uh, quite uh, effective, at least initially, in lung cancer. Uh, unfortunately, when EGFR kinase inhibitors were uh, used in glioblastoma, the outcome was, qu was quite poor. Uh, the patients do not respond to this. It's not a question of uh, acquired resistance over time. The patients simply, uh, most patients simply do not respond. The, the, the therapy is ineffective in all but about 10 to 15 percent of patients. So the question that we wanted to address is why are EGFR kinase inhibitors ineffective in, in glioblastoma in this particular disease? Uh, now, unlike uh, other EGFR-bearing uh, cancers such as lung cancer, the mutations uh, that are associated with glioblastoma are in the ext extracellular domain of this kinase. And there are um, some postulates, mainly from uh, Ingo Mellinghoff's lab at Sloan, uh, that the inhibitors failed to dampen the kinase activity of this receptor when the mutations are extracellular. Um, there have been reports from Ron DePinio's group, uh, Jane Stommel's paper, that uh, there's actually a co-activation of a number of receptor tyrosine kinases. So even if you are inhibiting EGFR, uh, there's signaling from uh, RB3, PDGF, as well as MET. Sometimes uh, because of therapy, there is uh, a compensatory activation of alternative receptor tyrosine kinase signaling. Uh, and, and also there are downstream mutations which would render the kinase inhibitor essentially ineffective. Um, and quite possibly there are other, other mechanisms. And so we were uh, interested in this and the experimental model system that we decided to pursue is, a, um, is based off a patient-derived xenograft line uh, called GBM6. This was originally isolated and described by David James when he was at UCSF. And this is a, a, a good case study because here, um, as you can see, these GBM6 um, cells, they, they have amplified EGFR as well as the V3 mutant. So these are EGFR positive tumors. When we uh, tested erlotinib, an EGFR kinase inhibitor, in vitro, so when these cells were taken uh, and were grown in culture, and we measured the proliferation by BRDU due, um, treatment before and after, uh, the, the, the proliferation of these cells in culture was actually inhibited by erlotinib, by the EGFR kinase inhibitor. A and then we also performed an invasion assay, given that EGFRs, uh, one of the primary characteristics of these cells is this uh, high invasiveness. And for this, we would um, make organotypic cultures of rad brain slices. So this is um, invasion in an authentic brain matrix. And then we uh, label these cells with GFP, the, the GBM6 cells and would uh, implant them on this brain slice and, and, and uh, later we calculated how many cells were able to penetrate this matrix uh, looking at the fluorescence uh, by confocal microscopy and this expresses a, a sort of an invasion index and as you can see the inhibitor was actually effective in vitro in reducing proliferation and invasion but for the same cells uh, it was known uh, uh, that when these cells, the same GBM6 cells, are implanted intracranially in a mouse model and then the mice are treated with erlotinib, it's essentially uh, ineffective. There is hardly any change in mean uh, survival outcome. So the question is, is why? And so we, um, at this point, rationalized that there is something going on in, in the in vivo context. The tumor microenvironment is providing some support to the tumor cells and, and helping it overcome um, uh, the EGFR kinase inhibitor treatment. And as we are interested in signaling pathways, we were considering many different signaling pathways that could be engaged in the context of, uh, of the tumor uh, or in the tumor. And one of the pathways that I'm going to talk about today is, uh, is NF-kappa B. So NF-kappa B is, uh, is one of the primary response, uh, signal response elements within cells. It's very important in the context of inflammation. And what we found is GBM6 cells uh, had when they were implanted in, in mice, and then we took out the tumor cells and looked at uh, its nf kappa -B gene expression, the genes were turned on. So nf kappa -B is, is activated in these tumor cells in vivo. Now, nf kappa -B, uh, has been reported as an, as an oncogenic signal in the context of GBM. Uh, patients with mutations in an inhibitor of nf kappa -B signaling, hence they have an active nf kappa -B pathway, 
Um, the prognosis in, in those glioblastoma patients is essentially as poor as EGFR amplification. However, the interesting information here is that only about 5% of patients would co-harbor these two mutations. Activation of NF-kappa B and gain of function of EGFR uh, doesn't usually happen in the same patient. But when we looked at GBM6 as well as other patient-derived uh, patient samples and looked for their NF-kappa B gene expression signature, we find that the NF-kappa B pathway is frequently on in GBM. E, uh, and even in the absence of this dis well-described I-kappa B mutation, so the inhibitor uh, is intact, so there is no mutation in this pathway, but the pathway is still active. And this is happening in, in GBM where there is EGFR gain of function. So how is NF-kappa B uh, being turned on in, in GBM in vivo? And uh, when we were looking at patient samples, and by we, we I, I mean my uh, collaborating pathologists, they described that uh, there was a number of CD68 positive immune cells, myeloid immune cells, that, that infiltrated the brain. We have now been, uh, ex been extending this work. There's a number of CD163 positive um, microglia or macrophages that, that infiltrate GBM tumors. Uh, most of, the, of these macrophage subtypes, at least in vitro, can produce TNF-alpha, and we also could detect TNF-alpha, this cytokine, in a brain tumor uh, sec tissue uh, as opposed to non-tumor brain. And to model this in vivo scenario of TNF and active, uh, activation of NF-kappa B uh, and test whether this has anything to do with uh, a lot in the resi resistance, we adopted a co-culture model where we would grow this GBM6 tumor cells uh, in the presence of primary monocytes made from, um, uh, from peripheral blood. And that scenario recapitulates the increased TNF that we could detect in vivo. When we co-culture GBM cells with monocytes, there was an increase in proliferation of these tumor cells. And though that could be inhibited by including an anti-TNF antibody during this co-culture. So TNF essentially drives increased proliferation of, of GBM uh, as well as increased invasion. And we further uh, used an independent model. These are uh, immunocompetent mice, either wild type or lacking the TNF alpha gene. And when we implanted uh, now um, mouse-derived tumor, uh, astrocytomas GL261, in this mice, the, if the mice were, lacked the TNF alpha gene, then they survived longer, suggesting that TNF is playing a role in aiding and abetting tumor progression in vivo. And finally, we directly tested that, um, that the erlotinib effect was essentially obliterated or erased in the presence of TNF alpha. So, as I reported before, in vitro, in, in when these GBM cells are cultured uh, and erlotinib is applied, we can inhibit proliferation as well as invasion. But when we added TNF to the culture, uh, there was no effect of erlotinib. Importantly, Importantly, allotinib could still inhibit the EGFR receptor phosphorylation. So the receptor was inhibited, yet proliferation in, and invasion uh, was no longer affected because uh, we, we proposed that TNF-alpha can drive the NF-kappa B signaling, which is essentially a parallel oncogenic signal that is being provided to these cells in vivo. So at this point, uh, we um, we're left with trying to identify, um, or, or left with this question, that can we identify a therapeutically tractable target that functions not only in the receptor tyrosine kinase signaling pathway, but also in the NF-kappa B signaling pathway, given that there are two pathways that are on simultaneously in these tumor cells. Um, and if, if we can identify such a common component, we, had, we wanted to show that this is indeed relevant in the context of the human disease, and then we wanted to test uh, preclinically, at least in mouse models, whether there is any therapeutic efficacy. So uh, we've set about trying to identify a target. And since we are interested in, in, in kinases and signaling, we initially focused on the kinome or the collection of kinases that's present in the human genome. Uh, and uh, we narrowed, narrowed in into one particular kinase called atypical protein kinase C or APKC. So this belongs to the PKC group of kinases, and uh, we were able to show that APKC functions downstream of a number of receptor tyrosine kinases, uh, 
uh, shown over here is APKC kinase activity in response to EGF in the brain in GBM6 cells. Uh, APKC is activated when you add EGF to, the, to this culture um, in, in, in using a number of different GBM cell lines and it also drives um, a gene expression in e of a number of uh, genes that have been described as oncogenic in the context of, uh, of glioblastoma. Now a good thing about uh, of this target is that this is farther downstream of, of this receptor tyrosine kinases as well as P10. So potentially attacking this, this uh, target would be effective even in the context of P10 loss, which normally overcomes resistance if you, if you try and attack this first line over here. So this is, this is significantly downstream. Furthermore, APKC was actually uh, uh, important in the context of TNF-alpha signaling, which drives NF-kappa-B activation. Uh, so uh, when we co-cultured GBM6 with monocytes, uh, APKC was activated. This activation could be blocked with anti-TNF antibodies. Um, APKC activation, of course, was blocked by erlotinib since this is downstream of receptor tyrosine kinases, but TNF treatment would rescue this proving that APKC is also a downstream target of TNF. Um, we showed that APKC, uh, uh, the TNF-driven NF-kappa-B activity required APKC, so we observed APKC activity before the NF-kappa-B target genes would be activated after application of TNF-alpha. And finally, we tested a small molecule kinase inhibitor. This was reported um, uh, by, uh, by Pfizer, and we actually synthesized this in-house um, and then we, we tried the efficacy of this small molecule inhibitor in the GBM6 uh, monocyte co-culture, both in the context of direct application of TNF as well as in the uh, GBM6 monocyte co-culture, we were able to reduce EGFR signaling, EGFR dependent gene expression by using this small molecule inhibitor. So the question is now, is uh, APKC uh, relevant in the context of the human disease? So we looked at about 350 patient samples uh, uh, with our collaborating pathologists, and they described that atypical PKC staining was significantly enhanced in glioblastoma, including in, in, in characteristics uh, that define glioblastoma, for example, pseudopalisading necrosis. This is an area of anaplastic tumor cells surrounding uh, a, 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 pseudo ne a necrotic area. And this, this staining was significantly more than th that we ever observed in non-tumor cells. So APKC upregulation of the protein is associated with the human disease. Uh, furthermore, patients, uh, this is a retrospective analysis, patients that, were, uh, that stained very highly for APKC, they had a much poorer survival outcome than APKC weak or APKC negative GBM. Finally, um, we tried to test whether uh, inhibition of APKC would confer therapeutic efficacy in mouse models of glioblastoma. So the first experiment we did was um, we first tested this uh, GBM6 co-culture in vitro, which I believe I already described. But then we went in, uh, we implanted those cells, the, the uh, two different GBM cell lines, U87 EGFR V3 uh, cells or GBM6 cells, uh, intracranially, we uh, implanted those cells, uh, and then uh, we, we either imp uh, implanted cells that were uh, wild-type glioblastoma cells, or those cells followed by knocking down or silencing of uh, APKC gene expression. And as you can see, uh, when the cells uh, were not expressing APKC, when APKC expression was silenced with uh, shRNA, the tumor size was, was uh, a lot smaller, and these mice um, survived a lot longer. They, they would survive uh, up to almost 40 days instead of about 50, uh, 12 to 15 days um, in our hands. And finally, we tested uh, the small molecule inhibitor. Now, since this is, this is just a tool compound, this, we don't really know much about the PKPD of this compound, so we, we couldn't really treat the animals orally with this. Uh, but what we did was use an ALZ mini pump and, directed, uh, um, and gave the drug directly at the site of tumor. Uh, using cannula. Now, this is uh, sort of similar to uh, a, a clinical method called convection-enhanced drug delivery. So it's, um, it, it might have some clinical relevance. And when we, when we did that, um, 
we saw a remarkable response in this GBM6 cells. Uh, so this is U87 cells first. We did, did this first on this U87 cell line. Uh, the tumor volume was a lot smaller in the drug treated compared to the, to the cell line treated controls. Now finally, we took the drug and we, we tested it on this GBM6 uh, cell line. Now this GBM6 in vivo, as I, as I said, is not sensitive, not responsive to erlotinib. So erlotinib fails in vivo. So this was our, um, a, a true test of, uh, of the small molecule inhibitor uh, of APKC. So we implanted GBM6 cells in mice and, and then directed the drug directly at that site. And again, we get a remarkable response. I'm very excited to report that, uh, that we were very surprised and very happy with, with the response we received with the small molecule inhibition. So um, in summary, what I've described today is that, that we define a molecular uh, signaling pathway downstream of both receptor tyrosine kinases and uh, TNF NF kappa B signaling in the context of glioblastoma. And these two pathways, uh, one of the sh a shared component was this kinase called atypical protein kinase C. Now I'm going to spare you the signaling details over here, but the signals do not merely converge on this kinase. This, ki this kinase can associate with scaffold with different sets of scaffold proteins in these two different uh, signaling pathways. Regardless, uh, this, is a, this is a common denominator for these pathways. And when we target this by s either uh, genetically silencing this pathway or using small molecule inhibitors, we get remarkable efficacy, uh, at least in, in, in a mouse model. GBM tumor progression is inhibited, suggesting that this kinase has an important role uh, in this disease. So these studies um, were actually, uh, we started the studies um, in Arizona and, um, and then subsequently we've moved over here. This paper uh, ha is just came out um, about a month ago in science signaling. Uh, it was, the most of the work was done by a really talented graduate student, Yael Kuzni um, and Edward Mandel, who is in the audience. Uh, they led this study. And, uh, and this work was actually done in collaboration with Carla Rotlin's lab. Uh, Carla is an assistant professor in, in immunology department and Antonio and Andrea in the lab helped us a, a lot in terms of characterizing the, the macrophages and the TNF uh, signaling. So we are also indebted to a number of our clinical collaborators, neurosurgeons and neuropathologists, as well as chemists, um, and also, also our funding from uh, NIH, which enabled us to do these studies. So thank you very much for your time, and if there are any questions, I'll be, I'll be happy to respond. <laughs>